I'm joined today by Jed Morey. He is the author of this book, The Great American Disconnect, Seven Fundamental Threats to Our Democracy. Jed, really great to talk to you. I'll very quickly just kind of give the audience the list so they know what these threats are that we're talking about, and then we'll delve into it. You talk about deregulation, speculation, fundamentalism, the assault on liberty, militarization, incarceration, and manufactured consent. In reading through the book, I was interested because there's kind of a mix of threats, some of which seem to resonate more with traditionally the American right and some probably more of them with the American left. What are your politics that led you to write this book? You know, I, writing the book actually was an incredible personal exploration of my personal politics because it allowed me and which our profession does. Uh, it allowed me to really investigate my personal feelings about it, but research based. And I dispensed with uh, a few things that I held dear. Uh, I learned a, a great deal through the writing process. Uh, I would say that my politics in general are very progressive. Um, but I'm, and, and to your point, I'm interested, though, at this moment in our history where we have this bizarre intersection in some cases between the progressive end of the spectrum and then the some of the conservative and and or uh, libertarian end of the spectrum. Yeah, it There's seems a, especially with things like the assault on liberty and you talk about the use of the Espionage Act by President Obama when we look at signature strikes and drone usage, there are problems with that policy that we hear from the progressive left as well as the libertarian right not always the same explanation for why there's opposition, but at least there seems to be somewhat of a shared concern or goal there. Yeah, I think in the general mainstream media, these uh, they, they tend not to go very deep. They use these issues in a very shallow way uh, that allows them to turn them into talking points for one side or another. Uh, and what I tried to do was really have a deeper examination of where these policies come from and how exactly we got to this point. Forget about how anybody is manufacturing them on one side or another to score political points, but why exactly we find ourselves in the circumstances that we are today. Well, and interestingly, I was thinking along those lines, and I wonder if you would agree that when we look at your seven threats, we can explore all of them through the lens of inequality in the United States. If we look at deregulation favored by the rich and big corporations, if we look at speculation, your second threat, Speculation has been the baby of Wall Street. If we look at uh, uh, militarization, there are huge companies and rich people getting even richer through the militarization of police and, and uh, 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 fighting terror. Do you explore this lens? I do. And, and the, you know, these are these threats are really tributaries for more fundamental aspects of who we are as a nation that and, and things that we battle and have battled throughout our history whether that's uh, talking about just general human nature with greed uh, so, and inherent racism that still exists in this country um, and uh, the sense of in, imperialistic entitlement that we, we still hold dear to. So I'm examining them with those being sort of the root causes and looking at the intersection of them. And I think people will be surprised at how much they actually do intersect, how much the same players are behind the scenes of all of these different threats. No question. You know, one of the ones you have is manufactured consent. And when we look at that one, big corporations and executives are controlling the media. And then if you look at seemingly a separate one, for example, speculation, speculation leads us back to Wall Street, very large media conglomerates and some of the same executives that are involved in big media are involved in the big financial firms, either as members of boards of director, et cetera. So it's very interesting how seven seemingly very different threats, for example, fundamentalism and militarization also connect when we look at the religious basis being used to both wage war and oppose certain social policies in the United States. Do you think that the seven threats can be boiled down in terms of their origin? Uh, I think they boil down to a couple of different places, and one is this uh, idea of American exceptionalism and the fact that we do have imperialistic tendencies, that we do see ourselves as separate and above all other nations, and but we have also this bizarre self-loathing aspect to it where we honor civil liberties 
in our speech and in the way that we conduct our, our politics in the public, but behind closed doors and the way that the laws are written and the way that media has been consolidated and the way that uh, corporations have gained so, such a foothold in this country really belies that, that fundamental aspect of civil liberties that we've clung to. So, and, and you hit on the ultimate um, manifestation of all of these different items, which is really this gross inequality that we're experiencing right now. And that's finally reached the, the mainstream media. And of course, the forces are going to work to try and claim it in different ways and try to manipulate it in different ways so that they can still achieve the same end result. But the fundamental fact exists that there is gross inequality in this country and, of course, in the rest of the world. In an effort to kind of be more pragmatic and solution oriented, which is something that a lot of my viewers suggest I try to do in 2014, the last couple of minutes of the interview, what types of solutions could we look at? How could we improve the situation that you describe is, is based in these seven threats? When I think of solutions, my mind goes to two things. I could make the case individually for the seven threats. I won't do that because I want you to kind of give us your thoughts and they would be looking at how politics is funded and looking at media because media coverage for most Americans is how they see all seven of these threats or don't see them as the case may be. And so I would focus on money in politics and media. Do you agree or is the solution elsewhere? I agree. It would be very difficult to affect any sort of positive change that would attack this uh, gross inequality that we're experiencing right now. Um, and really this economic depravity that, it, that is so uh, ever present that you, you would have to get back to the root of money in politics and get the money out of politics. And that seems like a really big job, but it's something that's necessary to facilitate other aspects of, of things that we could fix in a real politique sense. Um, I, go, you know, I, I tend to go back to the economic arguments uh, where I start the book with deregulation and speculation. I think that, that readers will be surprised at just how far we have gone from uh, the fundamental aspects of even capitalism. I mean, we believe that we live in this capitalistic society and that it is produced an overall good, but if it, it is so easy to legislate a few fixes with respect to deregulation and curbing rampant speculation that could at least return some normalcy into the economic system that more people would be able to participate. And you know, one, one message I would love to convey is we need to have a better discourse in this country that gets away from trying to uh, claim that one side or the other is trying to redistribute the wealth and get ourselves back on a path where we, we're talking about creating a more equitable access to wealth. People would be very surprised by just how rigged the economic system is. Absolutely. And, those and things, the best those things are fixable. The best example I've come up with, and I had been talking about it for years and ultimately saw it actually used, I think, in the movie, I think it was in Park Avenue, the documentary Park Avenue, is the right will often point to the rules are the same for everybody. And I think the, the monopoly analogy is perfect. If everybody playing monopoly plays by the same rules, it might seem like things are fair. But if one of the players comes in after the property has been divvied up, the bank has already given away all of its money, just because on paper you're playing by the same rules doesn't mean everyone has the same shot at success. And that really seems to encompass a lot of what's going on with inequality right now. Yeah, and th this, is, this is not just something that happened overnight. This was an assiduous effort over the past four or five decades to really create a system that rewards a specific type of behavior. And I talk a little bit about that at the end of the deregulation segment, where you're talking about some of the greatest quantitative theorists in the world are basically saying that, you know, we don't have a market problem, even though electronic trading is adding a new element to everything. But what we have is a, a behavior problem where we're rewarding the wrong behavior. And worse than that, we've legalized that type of uh, reward system over the past several decades. And every administration share some of the blame in in that ideology in the in the uh, deregulation as an ideology. We've been speaking with Jed Mori. The book is The Great American Disconnect, Seven Fundamental Threats to Our Democracy. Really, each of the seven threats is worthy of its own in-depth discussion. Check out the book. And Jed, thank you so much for joining us. David, can't thank you enough for having me on.